Well, thank you all so much for attending. Uh, this is Linux Foundation Public Health's introduction to our newest project, Herald, which is an exposure notification solution that Adam's going to go into in much more detail. Uh, but we're really, really glad to have it as uh, one of the projects under our umbrella that we are nurturing and growing. Uh, and we will cover uh, all sorts of information in this. There's also, there is a, uh, we'll be doing Q&A at the end. Uh, so if you have a question that comes up uh, at any point in time, feel free to drop it in the Q&A uh, and we will uh, answer those. Um, with that, I am very glad to introduce Adam Fowler. He is the lead um, maintainer on this project, the chair of their, um, their technical steering committee, and uh, I will let him take it from here. Adam, the floor is Brilliant. Here. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, share my screen. And there we go. Hopefully you can all see the uh, <clears throat> slide there. So yeah, my name is Adam Fowler. I am the uh, TSC chair for the Herald Project and one of the uh, originators of the project. I'll be going through today just a brief introduction, saving quite a lot for the Q&A. So please do uh, get your questions ready and send them through and I'll answer them uh, at the end. Um, we're going to cover this kind of back to front rather than start with the technology. I'm going to start with the kind of problem space, some sample problems. Now we all know digital contact tracing and exposed notification is one, but I'm going to mention a whole load that we're trying to aim at because we're not just a a kind of one trick pony as a project, there's different ways it can be applied. So I'm gonna go through those um, and that'll discuss what Herald can do today and then what Herald will be able to do very soon in the next couple of months. Um, and then um, a bit of a plea for people to get involved, the more the merrier. Um, even if you're not traditionally a programmer, don't worry, we don't just need programmers. And if you're a new programmer to open source, then feel free to join as well. Uh, and as I said, there's Q and A at the end. So Herald, what can it do? So what's the end game? What are we trying to help with? So there's a use case here, uh, hospital pages. The uh, hospitals are very well shielded. Um, so mobile phone signals generally don't penetrate. Um, so the idea here is to put a Bluetooth mesh network within there. They can communicate with personal devices. So iPads of doctors, uh, mobile phones of people who are on call whilst they're within the hospital and it's a resilient network to enable messages to be passed between them. So that involves consumer devices, iPads, iPhones, Android phones, as well as a Bluetooth mesh uh, carrier network. So that integration of the two, that gateway, is something Herald can help with. Another use case, if you imagine a small beacon, low power beacon, um, attached to a medical device, so it doesn't, it's not part of the medical device, so it doesn't require special certification. Um, but if you imagine that transmitting, hey, I'm here, and you've got this mesh of beacons around, you can triangulate its relative position um, within the hospital. Uh, apparently, this is a really common problem in the UK. Uh, so syringe pushers, apparently each ward jealously guards its syringe pushers. It's really hard to find them. Um, so, you know, one shift might hide a couple in the staff room behind something and the next shift have no idea where they are. Uh, so, you know, these very expensive life-saving pieces of equipment are quite hard to get hold of, believe it or not. So that's another use case, but again, using the same uh, capability, but this time with a, a very low powered kind of uh, token with Bluetooth. Um, Marauder's map, I, li I like this view. So imagine a Marauder's map, but instead of, you know, it's just a holder that can see um, <clears throat> where they are until they say mischief managed, obviously. Um, so imagine with that network, they're saying, okay, you're within a, an area that's got navigation capabilities, you can download the digital map over that network, and those beacons tell you where they are um, within that map, which means that your device can triangulate its relative position. So, uh, and you can even download, you know, places within that hospital. So if you imagine for visitors who are wanting to go to a particular ward, you could help them navigate to that ward. If you're thinking of new staff, um, maybe you want to help them navigate as well but it's all held on the person's phone. So none of this is shared centrally. So it's like you've got your own personal Marauders map on your phone there, which is quite, quite an interesting uh, use case. You could also use the same thing to power, well, actually your doctor's running 15 minutes late, the coffee shop's three minutes away. Why don't you go to the coffee shop? We'll give you a bell. So it's a bit like going to Frankie and Benny's um, and the table's not quite ready yet. You get given one of those big beeper things. Instead of that, you just use your own mobile phone. 
that's quite a good use case. And if you extend the personal device and the where and the tokens to a wearable device, then maybe you can support assisted living. So in the UK, assisted living is a step between independent living and a care home. So people are still somewhat independent, but if they fall or if they, nobody's checked in on them in a while, um, you want a way of uh, kind of monitoring their, their safety. So by providing a wearable that monitors their health conditions, monitors if they have a sudden fall with an accelerometer, maybe you can uh, you know, help with that. Uh, on a more advanced scenario, maybe you just want to have an internal chat free network amongst the assisted living spaces near you with your friends, you could do that as well. And then, of course, there's the classic use case, which is digital contact tracing, which is uh, what everybody kind of understands uh, from Herald. It's the first use case we're obviously concentrating on, um, quite important at the moment. So uh, this is what we're currently doing. So, but fundamentally, the Herald API itself, at its lowest level, can detect other devices running a Herald protocol for a variety of different applications. It can exchange application payload data such as a contact tracing uh, payload, or, you know, a decentralized payload. Um, you can measure the RSSI over Bluetooth. Uh, other, pro you know, other mechanisms could be available in future, such as triangulation in a Bluetooth mesh or such as ultra wideband radio. And it can analyze the data it's seeing. So you can plug in different analysis models. So for example, you might have one model for COVID-19 transmission. You might have another model for Ebola transmission and the risk may vary so you you may want to put multiple analysis models in there as well so fundamentally at its lowest level that's what the herald api provides and then on top of that you effectively layer on your application payload such as digital contact tracing or you know a venue beacon for a an automated version of the qr codes when you go to a restaurant um, and then on top of that you layer uh, any kind of back-end infrastructure you need as well but at its simplest, these are the four things that Herald provides today. So today, what is in Herald? What's in, what's out? So what's in is this very complicated looking diagram. So anything kind of in gray at the bottom is provided by a device, so be it a smartphone, a wearable, or beacon, or mesh device. And then on top of that is the Herald API. So the low level information required to plug in to Bluetooth, to exchange payloads cryptographically, to store, um, any data and any OS specific kind of workarounds and in, in how they operate because everybody for some strange reason has a very very different Bluetooth API and so the Herald API provides this kind of uh, abstraction above that and then on top of that you can plug in different sensors so a default Bluetooth sensor you could um, plug in other support for the protocols too if you want so we currently support the Herald protocol but also two other protocols which we'll talk about later and we've just added um, distance conversion and risk estimation uh, and the analysis API in as well. So that's new. And then your application is built on top of that. So for example, a digital contact tracing application. And then that digital contact tra tracing application will talk to a backend. So that is generally provided by the public health authority. But what we're doing soon is we're providing a slightly higher level API to make you know, the, the creation of this for country is much, much quicker. So rather than having to hire 20 developers, you just hire somebody who can customize a white labeled kind of app. And we've also created a set of interoperability protocols, which are being built into European standards as we speak um, around the future interoperability between a variety of different contact tracing protocols. So that interoperability protocol isn't just about the Herald way of exchanging data. It's also supporting Gyne, Robert and OpenTrace as well. The capabilities we can do today, so in our demo app, we can provide a personal social mixing score. So over days, you can see how much mixing you're doing and it uses Bluetooth to kind of give you a score on that. Um, this currently is only relative to the individual's phone. It's not comparable to their friends. So you can kind of share it on Facebook and say, I've done really well, I've done 10,000 steps and I've kept my social mixing below a particular level. But in future, you'll be able to. We mentioned the venue diary as well. So rather than go into every restaurant and have to manually remember to scan a QR code to say you're there, um, you just walk in and walk out and that gives you your check-in and check-out times all stored on your phone. Um, so it's up to you how you manage that information. Our average detection time is two and a half seconds. Um, other protocols scan time can be as long as once every two minutes. So two and a half seconds for us. And we do this foreground and background on iOS devices and Android devices on wearables as well. I think we're still 
I mean, there's only two protocols, um, Blue Chase and ourselves in Herald, that support wearable devices. And our power usage is extremely low. It's only one to 2% per hour whilst doing readings every few seconds. And we support iOS, Android, and Zephyr real-time operating system, which is a wearable and beacon, you know, low power device operating system, which is another Linux Foundation project, interestingly enough. Crucially, we support really old devices because we want this technology to be available to everybody. You shouldn't have to buy a thousand dollar smartphone to be protected by digital contact tracing. So we believe in supporting very old devices, um, you know, back, you know, I think it's N minus five, N minus six versions rather than the standard N minus one or two. Uh, it's currently deployed as part of Australia and Alberta, Canada's digital contact tracing app. We've seen a great deal of success uh, in Alberta in particular. They've been live just over a week now and uh, they're recording an awful lot of information now that uh, which is even better than what they were expecting, which is great. And as I mentioned, we do support multiple protocols. So as well as obviously Herald with a variety of different payloads, decentralized and, um, <clears throat> you know, decentralized with epidemiological information. We also support Blue Trace and Gyne and we'll support Rob Air, which is the French protocol in the next couple of releases. So that's what we can do today, specifically digital contact tracing, because that's where we came from. Going soon though, we're looking at um, working with public health authorities and NGOs on some of their requirements. So one of the things that is abundantly clear is that not everybody's got a thousand dollar smartphone. And, um, you know, there's homeless people, there's older people, younger people that do not have smartphones. And there's also countries where this technology is so expensive, it's not prevalent in everyday use or, or the 4G IoT networks out there. So we've been working um, with an open source hardware designer, Mishka, who's fantastically created uh, these mockups. We've actually got some more mockups um, in the last couple of days showing a watch version. Um, so the one on the left is just the main board. So there'll be a battery on that side. And it's got a USB-C connection, so it's very small, fits in a standard strap, and that just provides digital contact tracing support, accelerometer, and a daylight sensor. The extra board on the right that is connected via ribbon cable to the main board is an optional extra board, which also provides the skin temperature and um, blood oxidation and pulse rate as well, so that's our health wearable. And these have been designed specifically so they can be mass produced using standard technology that's already out there uh, in relatively simple fabrication environments. So the wearable on the left is going to be around about $10 for a contact tracing wearable, $10 to $15. And the one on the right is about $25, $28 uh, per unit, which is amazingly cheap. So we're looking at potentially rolling these out. Uh, this is open source hardware. We, we've searched around for open hardware licenses. There's a relatively new one, only been around about a year, which is the CERN Open Hardware License Permissive Version 2, uh, which is, I think, Apache license, but for hardware. So you can incorporate, um, you know, technology that is effectively commercial. So, you know, there's Nordic semiconductor chips on there and there's some standard other chips on there. But the design it's can be used, can be taken and adapted for commercial or non-commercial applications. So, um, it's a really useful license and I'd highly recommend that for anybody designing hardware. But we're also looking at doing, funnily enough, you've saw Mesh mentioned 101 times, so we are looking at Bluetooth Mesh support. We see Bluetooth Mesh is a, a key technology that's not that widely used at the moment, and that's because everybody's kind of put in their own um, kind of vendor lock-in kind of protocol on top of Mesh which means that no IoT device tends to talk to another IoT device. We see that as a bit of a problem. But also, consumer devices can't be enrolled on a Bluetooth mesh network. You need a gateway protocol. So we're going to build Herald as a gateway protocol to enable the interoperability of devices uh, and link into backend services as well. So we'll support both devices and a backend server um, to provide that. And that provides most of the use cases you saw earlier. But well, Bluetooth Mesh is a great technology. It's, uh, you know, it's a mesh network. So if one node dies, then the other ones take over. Um, you know, it's a kind of publish subscribe type messaging array and it prevents relay and replay attacks, which is kind of something that I'm particularly keen on. Other items coming soon. So for individuals, if you're an individual with an app that's got held built in, what can you, um, you know, expect to see soon? Well, comparable social mixing scores. So we've now got the analysis API 
we've now got a, a distance conversion function and several risk functions. So once we've built the calibration in for that, you'll be able to compare your social mixing score to your friends. Um, crucially, that will also enable public health authorities to, uh, to, sorry, to give advice and say, well, actually, you know, please everybody try and keep your social mixing score below say 8,000 or something. Um, and then that gives you an idea as to as to what behaviours can reduce your chances of getting COVID rather than wait for the app to tell you that you've already been exposed. So it's, a, it's more of a proactive and a reassuring method as we go back to back to work. Um, we can produce uh, a white labelled digital contact tracing app and back end. Um, that will make it much easier to adopt a digital contact tracing app based on Herald uh, that supports interoperability with other protocols. Uh, also, we're going to allow, rather than you know, all the privileges or none of the privileges, we're going to enable an individual to say, well, actually, I'm comfortable with this amount of data sharing, or I'm comfortable with this amount of data sharing, and it's going to be tunable by the individual, but crucially defaulting to the lowest. Um, and we're also, of course, going to finish the low-cost wearable design. We're also going to support NFC pairing, because if, you're, if you've got young children who are going to school, or maybe you care for an older person, Maybe you've got a mobile phone and they need a wearable. So pairing the two together to enable upload and download is useful. Um, and ultra wideband radio is a fantastic technology, very, very accurate distance estimation on that. Unfortunately, it's still very expensive and not in that many mobile phones, but looking to the future, we'll look to support that perhaps next year. And for public health authorities, we're gonna enable insights on the back end because at the moment it's affects you know a lot of people are deploying um digitally enhanced manual contact tracing so they're using a digital method to spot extra contacts what they're not doing is using any intelligent analysis of the data on the device or on the back end to spot things like um super spreaders asymptomatic carriers um, to figure out where the spread is in, in a particular network. So that's what we're going to look at doing whilst preserving privacy. Um, we're going to try and you know, separate those two things out to make sure that you can tune it to what you want. Uh, and also the low cost general purpose e-health wearable. You know, it, we realized as soon as we created the digital contact tracing wearable, this would be widely applicable to kind of health monitoring use cases. So we're doing that as well. Um, and the international interoperability specification, we're going to produce a reference implementation that can be plugged in to nations existing public health backend. So you don't have to replace, you know, the Gain protocol or Blue Trace or Robert with Herald in order to use this. You'll be able to just plug in the backend services to enable all those protocols from all those countries to interoperate with each other whilst preserving the privacy of the individuals in each country. So that's crucially something we're, we're working on. And uh, we've been working with European standards bodies on that. So Adam's Sunlit Uplands, you know, as TSC chair, I can, you know, point to a far hill and say, this is the way we, we're going, people. Uh, so this is uh, Sunlit Uplands. Incidentally, when we do get released, if you want to come to uh, the United Kingdom and spend your hard-earned cash, feel free. It's very pretty. It looks like this. Um, <laughs> but what we're trying to do is, in Herald, it's not just about digital contact tracing. There's a whole range of uh, use cases, as you've seen, for consumer applications to talk to healthcare systems um, and for healthcare devices to talk to each other. So by producing a set of open source software and open standards around that, we're hoping to apply the kind of Herald uh, approach to multiple different aspects of e-health. So using hospitals, community care, end user devices, maybe, you know, you take your wearable to your docs, then you'll be able to upload that. And hopefully, you know, commercial wearable manufacturers, we already know one or two that are looking at uh, supporting Herald. So hopefully in the future, more will support it. And this will become a standard low cost way of uh, exchanging data because at the moment in e-health there's lots of proprietary ways of storing and sharing data and nothing talks to each other um, and we're hoping Herald's going to be a way of uh, breaking down those barriers to interoperability. Uh, we're also hoping that uh, we're going to produce white labeled healthcare applications both digital contact tracing and beyond to make it easier for healthcare systems to adopt this because it's all really well you know, rich Western countries spending 20 million on an app. But if that can't be then used by other countries, then, you know, people are going to die. So 
that we need to make sure that it can be used worldwide to help save lives and improve care everywhere, um, both with open source software and open source hardware design. So that's the, the sunlit uplands where we want to kind of aim towards. How you can get involved? Well, there are many things we need to do. You know, your herald needs you. So uh, obviously there's the programming which everybody thinks about and everybody knows about, but there's a whole host of areas around here. You know, user research. If I was somebody, you know, as a resident of an assisted living facility, how is this gonna help me? You know, user research there would be useful, talking to PHAs as well as individuals. Um, accessibility so i'm quite keen on this but i'm not very good at it so the more people can help with accessibility the better both on the website and mobile apps and presentations and videos um graphics as well we're creating introductory animations at the moment it's taken a while because i'm the least graphically minded person in the world and so are the people working with me um so you know if anyone's got any graphical skills and some free time please do help out there and on the epidemiology side, whilst I know lots of epidemiologists, they are unfortunately all extremely busy, as you can imagine. Um, so, you know, over time, if there's people who study in epidemiology that want to help out and write uh, or help design, um, you know, backend analytics risk, uh, you know, risk uh, algorithms, and that'd be great. We can help out with that. And with communication, so organizing meetups, managing, you know, Twitter, you know, and trying to get more people into the project we could do with some help on comms as well uh one thing i want to say is if this is you know the first open source project you've been exposed to because you normally work in healthcare and you're not sure you know open source is for those techies that know how to hack into government systems that's not the case um you know we can pair with you we can help you work on it find out what you want to work on and you know make sure that you, you know have a successful uh, positive contribution to the project um, and as it's uh, Autism Awareness Month, and I am autistic and I have ADHD, um, I want to make it absolutely crystal clear that Herald as a project is a neurodiversity friendly project. So if you struggled uh, to get involved in open source before um, and you didn't find the environment particularly good because of your neurodiversity, then please, please do contact me. Um, you know, I aim to make it as a neurodiverse friendly project as well. Um, you can easily grab me online at Adam Powell UK on Twitter or at ads on the Linux Foundation uh, Slack channel as well. But please, 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 even if you've only got a couple of hours a month, you know, a couple of hours of reading through things and fixing typos or, you know, creating a presentation on animation would be massively, massively helpful. So please do consider uh, joining and helping out as well. So that's it for the presentation. I wanted to save quite a bit of time for Q&A. So I was wondering, do we have any questions at all? Yeah, uh, thanks so much for that, Adam. Uh, it was really fantastic. Um, and I think that you know, it really shows that this is uh, about exposure notification, but the Herald really has a vision to be far more than that uh, and, and really impactful piece of software. So I was wondering, uh, perhaps you know, speaking about impact, how do you think about the, the impact that Harold is having today? How do you talk about that um, with the public health authorities you're working with? And do you have any ways of measuring it? We do. Unfortunately, everybody measures it differently. <laughs> so um, we're somewhat beholden to the PHAs on, on how they measure it uh, as well. Um, at the moment, most digital contact tracing, like I say, isn't actually digital contact tracing. It's digitally assisted manual contact tracing. And the reason that's different is because you only really see digital contact tracing's effect when it provides extra to manual contact tracing. So for example, somebody saying, oh, well, actually digital contact tracing spotted 200 cases. No, it probably spotted 10,200, but manual contact tracing spotted only the 10,000. Digital contact tracing allowed you to get the 200. There's no kind of automated response. You know, everything goes to a manual contact tracer and the manual contact tracer decides what to do or decides to pull down the data from the digital system. Whereas a true digital contract tracing system will have some mechanism for risk analysis, risk aggregation and automated policy based. You know, OK, if your risk goes over X, please do you know, self isolate for X period of time, for example. Mm -hmm. But no one's doing that today. Um, so it's a bit hard to measure, um, but we know from people who have 
move to Herald that they are getting much more data than previously. I would love to tell you about um, the Alberta statistics because I do know them, but they've not been cleared for release yet. So I can't really pre-announce them, but they are very, very successful. Um, you know, the very the amount of data that they're now getting is incredible uh, compared to before. And I know, for example, in Australia, there's over 7 million devices, Android and iOS devices with Herald on them. Um, in Alberta, I think there's 300,000 at the moment, probably increasing as we speak. And I know there's plans for one and a half million wearables in the next two to three months as well with Herald on them. So, you know, it's, it's fantastic considering, you know, we started probably nine, nine months ago now, something like that. And we're already in to public health authorities um, looking at more as well and more uh, commercial companies using it within their wearables so that this technology can get to more and more people. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's looking really good. Yeah. And could you talk a little bit about how, how do the, how do the uh, contributors to Herald all collaborate together? How do you work together as a, as a, as a global team? Yeah, it's really, it's a really interesting one, actually, because we are literally sped on every continent, <laughs> pretty much. I think the only place we've not got people is Antarctica, but give us time. Um, so, yeah, we've got people in Australia, Singapore, uh, UK, obviously, where I am, um, Canada, US, uh, all contributing into the project. So it's quite difficult. Luckily, I'm in, I'm in the middle, so I can coordinate both sets of time zones um which is pretty good but what we try and do is we use the linux foundation slack instance so we've got a kind of herald general channel and a herald code watch channel we also have our website and blog um and generally with phas we have regular one-to-one -one meetings um with them because they like kind of keep things quite close hold um because obviously these things have uh you know implications as to you know, we're thinking about this we're thinking about that and then we can provide feedback on that or try new things out so the social mixing scores are a classic point they're like oh we're not sure if there's anything around this you can do so we went away scratched our heads for a couple of weeks and created the social mixing score and that's going to be incorporated in a couple of apps soon and um, so so yeah we can go away and do that kind of blue sky thinking high risk investigation for the pha so that they they feel it's less of a risk to then adopt it um, and we're seeing more and more of that that's fantastic. Um, and, you know, I think with our, with our last minute here before before our, our time is up, uh, can you just remind people if they do want to get involved, what's the best way to get in contact with the Herald team? Yeah, sure. So the contact details on the community page on the website, but the easiest way is probably the Linux Foundation Public Health Slack instance. Come to the Herald general channel and get hold of us. Or you can email myself um, either at my work address, adamf at vmware.com or my personal address which is adam at adamfowler.org and then i can kind of direct you to the right people who are working on each aspect um, so yeah Great. more than of happy course. to take anybody on yeah <laughs> for anybody who wants to join the slack you can do that by visiting slack.lfph.io so that is definitely an easy way for people to, to sign up and get in contact with you marvelous well thank you so much to everybody who came and and attended this and, and listened to uh our, our pre to adam's presentation on herald thank you adam so much uh for sharing uh where herald is at where it's going uh as well as for your leadership on this project it's really been uh fantastic to see it already growing and gaining so much momentum and no, no, thank you for all your help as well it's been it's been hard work <laughs> yeah, kind of you know kick, kicking off this project and how it's grown so rapidly you couldn't have done it without you so yeah thank you a lot as well well looking forward to see it growing further thanks yep. so much everybody um and we'll be in touch thanks everyone